Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so we've been talking about uh, stationary state perturbation theory. And we've been specifically so far interested in the case of non-degenerate states. And so today we're gonna to be talking about what happens differently if the states are actually degenerate. But first let's summarize what we've found so far in a little bit more, in a little bit more shorthand notation than what we have been using. Okay, so one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna write for the matrix elements that we need WMP, that means the matrix element between any unperturbed state M and the perturbation Hamiltonian W and any other state unperturbed state P. And we're also going to write curly E with two subscripts, for example, N and M to be the difference between the unperturbed energies of those states. So curly E N minus curly E M, those are unperturbed energies. Okay, and then we can write what we found so far is the perturbed correction at first order in perturbation theory for the energy of state N is W sub N N. And at second order in perturbation theory, you sum over M not equal to N of W M N squared over curly E N M. Okay, and then at third order in perturbation theory, which we haven't written down so far, but it can be derived the same way as what we have done. So you sum now over two sets of, of complete states, M and K, let's call it. Okay, and now what we sum over is W sub NM, W sub MK, W sub KN, divided by the differences in energies, curly E and M, curly E and K. But wait, there's more. There is also a sum over just M. But in every case, it's the sum without including the N term. And this is going to be W sub N N magnitude of W M N squared over the square of the energy difference. Okay, and now let's just imagine what would happen if we continued on for a while and we were gonna write down the jth correction to the energy, not that we will ever actually use this, but what's that going to look like? There will be a term that's going to be similar to this term, except instead of summing over two, as we did here, or one, as we did here, we're going to be doing a sum over j minus one sets of states. So let's write that as sum m1 does not equal n, sum m2 does not equal n, all the way up to some m sub j minus one does not equal n. Okay, and then what appears here is a bunch of matrix elements in the numerator, w n m one, w m one m two, up to w m sub j minus one n, and in the denominator, what you get is a bunch of corresponding energy differences. All of these energy differences involve the state N that you're trying to find the correction to the energy for. So they look like this. Uh, 
Okay, and so that's just one of the many terms that can occur. I'm going to write plus dot dot dot. So this one term that I've written is this term is the generalization of the first term in each of the previous ones. But then there are generalizations of this term, which you get by sort of identifying different m sub j's. So for example, this one and that one, or this one and that one. And so you get a whole bunch of terms like that that we won't attempt to write down. OK, so that's what its general term looks like for the energies and then for the states. So there's a first order correction to the state n, which we worked out looks like this. OK, and it just involves the matrix element again divided by the energy difference. There's psi n2. So now we're going to sum over m does not equal n. OK, and so in every term, what we're really doing is we're summing over all the things that can possibly occur, which are the states m. But we are instructed by the way we normalize, the way we chose to normalize the states that we don't have to include uh, m equal to n. And so this is a, since this is an ortho basis, that's the most general thing it can possibly be. And now we just need to write down the, the coefficient that goes with it. So that's going to be sum k not equal to n wmk wkn over enm enk minus wnn wmn over curly enm squared. OK, and then you can imagine continuing on this forever, the jth correction <clears throat> to the state is going to be always a sum over m does not equal n times the state m times some horrible uh, set of terms, all of which look roughly the same. So the denominators always look like just the curly E with two subscripts. So curly E N M, which is curly E N minus curly E M, where the first one is always the state we are asking about. The one we want to compute the energy or the wave function for or the or the ket for. And the second one is the state or states being summed over. Which always exclude n. So as long as curly en and curly em are different for different states, then there's no problem. But the problem is that what happens if the unperturbed states n, or the specifically the unperturbed state that you're asking the question about, the, what's the energy for, let's say, has degenerate unperturbed Hamiltonian eigenvalues. So H0 eigenvalues. OK, so before we try to fix this problem, and let's note that it actually has to do with another related problem. And it may not be immediately obvious that these problems are related. But actually, if one thinks about it enough, one sees why they are related. And so the related problem is that the unperturbed state let's call it 
well, we'll, we'll keep calling it N, for a given perturbed state is ambiguous. So why is that a problem? That's a problem because when we started writing down our perturbative expansion for psi sub n, we assumed that there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the perturbed state and the unperturbed state, and that it was continuous so that we could do this expansion in lambda uh, and have it be well-defined. So let's say um, to see this, more graphically, let's say we start with the unperturbed state. Uh, N. And we look at the perturbed state corresponding to it. But now we're going to go back to thinking of it as a function of lambda. And so in the non-degenerate case, everything's going to be fine. This is the non-degenerate case. OK, so if we just say graph the energies as a function of lambda, they're going to look something like this, maybe. Okay, this is lambda. These are um, En of lambda. And we're starting at, let's say, curly E1, curly E2, and curly E3. And if we follow these lines, then we unambiguously get the energies that any other value of lambda just by following the lines, right? You can go back and forth between which one is which. And so the reason that's important is because if we go back here and we say, which states should we be excluding from the sum, we know which states should be excluded from the sum for any given, let's say, E2, because we just follow it back and we find curly E2, and that tells us which state we should be excluding from the sum. Right, but now let's do the degenerate case, and we're just going to graph the energy eigenvalues again. I could also, in a sense, I could be trying to graph the states themselves, but it's hard to graph a ket. The energies are actually numbers. So I'm going to, again, graph energy here as a function of lambda. And now, since it's degenerate, what that means is I might have one state that does this, but then I have another state uh, as a function of lambda that maybe does this, or at least the degenerate case means they're all meeting at a point. And what I'm graphing here is not the result of perturbation theory. What I'm graphing here is sort of the truth, what we would get if we could actually compute everything exactly, right? And so this is E1 and E2 and E3 and E4. And so if I go back up to here and I say, OK, for state E2, which state should I be excluding from the sum? And I follow this line back. But unfortunately, what I find out is there are several states that have that same energy eigenvalue. And so I don't know which of the three states that all have that same energy eigenvalue which, which one of those three should I be excluding from the sum when I'm doing uh, the sum up here? Okay, so does, that was graphically, to say that in words, let's say I had, and we'll just make it easy by saying there are only two of these states that are degenerate. Let's say I have N and M that both have the same unperturbed energy Okay, so they're meeting here. Then the question we need to be able to answer is which one of them is the correct one or ones to exclude from the sum? So then which linear combination uh, 
is psi n zero. That's the true unperturbed state for the state that's going to end up with energy E sub n. So I'll write below it E sub n. And which one is the other one? Okay, and so we need an unambiguous answer to this, this question. And because we exclude whichever uh, state is, is the same as the one we're talking about from the sum, the problem of the bad denominators, the curly ENMs that can blow up, is really the same problem as the fact that you might have chosen the wrong linear combination. Okay, so now that we've identified the problem, we can go ahead and state what the solution is. And the solution goes by the name of degenerate perturbation theory. And once we figure out how this goes, it turns out to be not as, not as difficult as you might think. So here's the statement of how it works. To find the unperturbed, or the, sorry, the perturbed state and the perturbed energy for states that have degenerate unperturbed energy, Degenerate here just means the same. So say I have a bunch of states that have the same degenerate energy. The first thing to do is consider the matrix W and M, which I remind you is just this matrix element in that subspace. Okay, so when that subspace means just among these states that have degenerate curly E's. Okay, now that matrix is because it's the set of matrix elements of a Hermitian operator is a Hermitian matrix. And that means we could, if we wanted to, and we do want to, we can choose the ortho basis to make it diagonal. So whenever you have a bunch of degenerate states, there's a freedom to choose your ortho basis among those states. And we're going to do so by making W and M diagonal. Okay, and this is a choice that we, we are free to make and we are going to make. Now, first, before we make that choice, we need to remember why it is we're allowed to make that choice or why it's guaranteed that we will always be able to. And the answer is a theorem that you can find back in the notes that we proved back in uh, the last semester. So it's guaranteed by theorem 2.6.5 which in fact says exactly that, that if you have a Hermitian matrix, you can choose an ortho basis of its eigenstates, right? So we've identified, we've identified a Hermitian matrix and we go ahead and do that. So first, um, before doing that, let's say what we need to do to do that, we need to solve an eigenvalue problem. So we need to solve the eigenvalue problem, which is typically going to look like this. That the determinant of the perturbation Hamiltonian minus lambda times i equals zero. Okay, and so if you can solve that problem, then you get the eigenvectors of your matrix W and M 
And those are going to what be what we choose to resolve the ambiguity as our states, as our unperturbed states n and the eigenvectors are going to be the first order correction to the energy. Okay, so in that basis, since it's diagonal, uh, W and N here is just a set of numbers. And those are the first order correction to the energies. And we've resolved our ambiguity of which state we should exclude from the sum by uh, choosing them to be the, the Ns. Now, there's one annoying feature of this, which is we're assuming that we can actually solve this eigenvalue problem. And maybe we can't, maybe, it's, maybe that is also too difficult of a problem. In that case, well, that's just the way things go. But there's a good reason why this is much easier than just solving the complete problem. And that is because we're solving this eigenvalue problem usually on a subspace that's very small, hopefully two by two or something like that, or three by three. We're not solving it on the complete subspace of states. Okay, which might be much more difficult and typically is much more difficult. Okay, anyway, let's just assume that we can actually solve that problem and that we have solved that problem, that eigenvalue problem on that subspace of states. Then if you follow what we did before, you find that Lots of the terms are zero. And the reason they're zero is because if we assume that W and M is diagonal, then anything where N is not equal to M on a degenerate subspace is going to give zero, right? And so those terms will not, not occur in the sum. And so you will find, so we find, I'm not going to go through the whole procedure that we did before, but for example, for the second order correction to the energy, you get a sum over M, M W N squared. This looks exactly like what we had before. We're summing over M here, but now you exclude not just M equals N, you actually exclude all terms that have curly EM equals curly EN. So I'm gonna denote that by putting a little prime on the sum. The prime means we exclude all M with curly EM equals curly EN which is great because that means that we're excluding all terms where the denominator could actually be zero, making the whole thing blow up, right? So in that sense, we've solved the problem. We solved the problem by excluding all the terms that could possibly blow up. And then we find for the state, We similarly sum over all M's, but with a prime on it of M, M, W, N over curly E, N minus curly E, M. Okay, and so again, we're just excluding that we, we exclude the terms that could possibly cause a problem. Okay, and so, and by the way, here we've already got what the first order corrections were, they're just the eigenvalues of the matrix W and N. If you're talking about a non-degenerate set of states, well, a non-degenerate state in the unperturbed sector, then this is just a number. It's a one by one matrix because again, we're just doing this on the subspace of each degenerate unperturbed eigenvalue. And so if there's only one of them, this is just a number, not a matrix and you've already, there's nothing to do. Okay, so that's really all there is to degenerate perturbation theory, almost. There's one more complication we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes that 
uh, actually doesn't arise very often, but we have to worry about it anyway. So let's summarize the process of degenerate perturbation theory. So to find the perturbed energy and the perturbed state, step one is for each subspace of states with degenerate unperturbed energy eigenvalues, you stop and you rechoose your unperturbed states if they are not already chosen in the right way. So you choose your unperturbed ortho basis so that, okay, N matrix element W matrix element M is equal to a set of numbers W sub N times the Kronecker delta for every pair of unperturbed energies that are equal. So this is just your diagonal matrix. Okay, and so that's step one. In favorable cases, you'll find out that accidentally step one has already been done for you. Maybe the basis, the ortho basis that you've been given has already got this feature that the perturbed Hamil the perturbation Hamiltonian is a diagonal matrix. But if not, then you have to stop and do this step. Now, sometimes, and we'll find this, for example, when we do the fine and hyperfine structure of the hydrogen atom, it's not obvious right away which is the, the ortho basis anyway. And so you, al you always have to make sure you choose an ortho basis. And this step one is just telling you which choice should you make among many choices that might seem plausible otherwise. It's easier to see this in examples perhaps than, uh, than saying it abstractly. Okay, and then step two is just a one line statement that the first order correction to the energies are in this basis, the same thing that they were before. Namely the expectation value of the perturbation Hamiltonian W, but it's important that it's in this special basis that we chose in step one. And then step three, is you do everything that you would have done if it were non-degenerate perturbation theory, except you exclude every term that would have been infinity. So in all higher order sums involving WMN, which is our notation for the matrix element, we just exclude the terms with curly EN equals curly EM. Okay, and then you can continue doing this to as high order and perturbation theory as you want in principle. Okay, any questions on that so far on how we do degenerate perturbation theory? We will start doing an example on a little bit. But uh, okay, so let me mention one complication, which is actually not going to come up in any of our examples, whether in class or that we do for homework. But it's an important one anyway, sort of conceptually. So the complication that could occur is that I said you should choose the ortho basis to make W sub n m be diagonal, but what if there's more than one choice? So what if the eigenvalues not only of H0 are degenerate, but you compute the eigenvalues of W and M and they are also degenerate. Then what do you do? Because the whole point is we need a unique one-to-one -one correspondence between our states psi sub n 
and our unperturbed states n. And so the problem here is the corresponding states n that we would like to choose are still ambiguous. Okay, so the problem is we need a way to choose them that's not ambiguous. And to resolve this, let me just tell you what you do. So this really only shows up, one of the reasons this is fairly rare is it only shows up at second order in the wave function or third order in the energy. And so to resolve it, which we won't be doing. So to resolve this, we note that if you look at second order in the wave function, The problem is it contains terms like the following. So there's a sum over m not equal to n, m times a sum k not equal to n, m, w, k, k, w, n over curly e, n minus curly e, m times curly E n minus curly E k. Okay, and so the point is that only states k outside of the degenerate subspace can, can contribute because of the way we chose the matrix elements. And so to resolve this, what we can do is look at the following operator. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is just do a sum over k not equal to n, w k k n or k w over curly E n minus curly E k. So what I've done there is I've just identified the operator whose matrix elements in M and n are appearing in the previous formula. Okay, and if I look at this operator, it has the property that it's Hermitian. Okay, and so it can be diagonalized. On the, uh, on the space of states where, it's, uh, where W is degenerate. So it can be diagonalized on the subspace where WMN is degenerate. Okay, and so if you do this, then you choose your ortho basis to not only make WMN be diagonal, but to make this operator be also diagonal, which you can also do by the same theorem that we chose before. And having done that, you will have constructed a basis so that the following is a diagonal matrix. So M, W, K, K, W, N over curly E, N minus curly E, K. Those are just the matrix elements of the previous operator. And so by construction, you have made things so that this is a set of numbers. Okay, and that chooses your unperturbed states for you. Okay, and so that will resolve the ambiguity. This is all the, all this degenerate perturbation theory is really about 
resolving the ambiguity between the perturbed states and the unperturbed states in such a way that you don't get horrible denominators that would be, go to zero and therefore make everything blow up. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so let's do an example. And so the famous example that, to which this applies is the Stark effect in the hydrogen atom. Okay, and actually in the Stark effect in the hydrogen atom, we're going to find that depending on which state we're talking about, we either use degenerate or non-degenerate perturbation theory. And so we'll have to decide which one to use depending on which state we're talking about. We'll see how that happens. But first let's just set, set up the problem. So the problem is just that we're going to apply an electric field which is going to be a constant and we'll take it to be pointing in the z hat direction because why not? Later on, we'll be talking about what happens if it's not a constant electric field. But so here's your unsuspecting hydrogen atom consisting of a proton with positive charge. And you can imagine it surrounded by a cloud of electrons representing its wave function. And so physically, of course, what's going to happen is that the positive charge is going to be moved up in the electric field and the negative charge is going to be moved down. Okay, and so the question we want to know is how do the bound state energies change? Professor? What did you say the reason that the positive charges move up and the negative charge moves down? Just because they're moving in response to the electric field that's being applied. Oh, okay. Right? So charged particles move in the direction of the positive charged particles move in the direction of the electric field. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we could experimentally, of course, we could just measure how the bound state energies change by measuring we, you know, if we measure that light given off or absorbed by a hydrogen atom, then we can measure the energies of the photons that we see, and that will tell us the bound, that will tell us at least the differences in the bound state energies. And so this is something that we could measure experimentally, but now we just want to compute theoretically what, what these should do. Okay, so first of all, let's consider the ground state, n equals one. And the ground state of the hydrogen atom is not degenerate. And so that tells us that we're, we can do um, non-degenerate perturbation theory. And just looking ahead to what we're going to find, we're going to find out that the energy change is quadratic in the applied electric field magnitude. For n equals two, then there is a degeneracy. There is more than one state with, uh, that has the n equals two quantum number that have the same energy. And so this is going to be linear, it turns out, in the electric field. You can take those as experimental facts and now we want to understand where they come from. Okay, so, so the first thing we're going to do is figure out what the per perturbation Hamiltonian is. So we are adding an electric potential okay, which we're going to call capital Phi. And that's equal to minus the applied electric field times the z coordinate z. Right now I'm just writing things classically. And so that's true because the electric field is minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. And so all I've done here is I've constructed the function 
whose gradient is equal to a constant e times z hat once I apply the minus sign in the definition. Okay, so that's the electric, electric potential. And so the potential energy associated with it for the electron or the change in potential energy is equal to minus E because that's the charge on the electron times the electrostatic potential phi. And so that's equal to the charge on the electron times the magnitude of the electric field times the Z coordinate, which I'm now promoting to an operator compared to the previous line where I was treating it classically. Okay, and so that's the change in potential energy compared to if I, were, if I wasn't including the electric field. So that's what's going to play the role of our W in perturbation theory. And again, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be writing down lambda. Lambda you can take to equal one because it's done its job of just counting which order in perturbation theory we're doing. Okay, so now in the non-degenerate case, things are relatively easy. Let's go ahead, at least conceptually easy. So let's go ahead and do the non-degenerate case. That's n equals one. So we're going to be computing the first order correction to the state one zero zero. Remember one zero zero is n l m, but if n is one, then l and m are both forced to be zero. Those are the only states that exist. And so we just have to compute this matrix element. Okay, which is little e times capital E times the matrix element of the operator Z. Okay, so I think we've actually already, or you've actually already seen this matrix element in a homework problem, but let's just review uh, how to compute this. So one thing to notice is that it's zero. And the reason it's zero is from parity. So the ground state of hydrogen has parity eigenvalue one. Okay, it's spherically symmetric, completely spherically symmetric. And so when I flip the Z, I get a, uh, or I flip any coordinate, I get a minus sign. So I'm taking a matrix element of two states, namely the same state, which both have even parity, but Z has odd parity. So if I take the parity operator, Z parity operator, I get back minus Z. That's saying that Z has parity, odd. And the reason is because parity takes the position coordinate and replaces it by minus itself. So in particular, it replaces Z by minus Z. And so the parity of the Z operator is minus one. Okay, and so by the parity selection rule, we learn not only does this contribution to the energy vanish, but something we will use again several times later in this course is the expectation value in the ground state of Z is zero. Okay, and in particular for this problem, that's telling us that the bad news is that the first order correction to the energy vanishes. Okay, and what that means is we're going to have to do it at second order in perturbation theory. That's related to the fact that the answer is actually going to be quadratic in the applied electric field. That's really, if you think about it, that's just another way of saying that the leading effect is is of second order in perturbation theory, not first order in perturbation theory. So although the non-degenerate case is conceptually easier, in practice, it's actually harder because you have to do one order more in perturbation theory than the degenerate case here, where we're actually, this is telling us 
in advance that we actually only have to do first order in perturbation theory to get that answer. Okay. So by the way, there is an alternate method besides the parity selection rule that you could use, and that's just to compute it. It's a little less elegant perhaps, but Z is equal to R times cosine theta. And so if you take the expectation value of Z in any spherically symmetric state, this looks like an integral with respect to cosine theta, or it's proportional to an integral with respect to cosine theta of cosine theta itself coming from the Z. Okay, and then everything else is some function of R that you might have to integrate over R, you might have to integrate over phi. Okay, but this is equal to one half cosine squared theta, evaluated at one minus evaluated at minus one, but those are the same thing. And so you get zero. Okay, so uh, we might as well take a small detour in this problem to go beyond what we might need specifically for this problem. And that's to ask for general selection rules for Z. These will turn out to be useful later. So more generally, let's ask the question of the selection rules. That's really saying, when do they vanish for matrix elements of Z? And so what we're asking is if we have a state of the hydrogen atom with general NLM and general N prime, L prime, N prime, and we consider that matrix element, when is this non-zero? By the way, I think it's true that whenever it can be non-zero, it actually turns out it is non-zero. So there's never a case that I know of where if I apply the selection rule and it doesn't say this has to vanish, then it actually, there's never a case where it actually does vanish if it doesn't have to vanish. Okay, so let's do one selection rule and then we'll do the more complicated one next time. So claim one is this vanishes unless M equals M prime. So we need M prime does not, sorry, M prime equals M. for this to not vanish. Okay, so let's prove that, see how it goes. And the proof is first, we're gonna start with looking at this commutator of L sub Z with Z. Okay, so you can compute this. L sub Z is X PY minus PY X. And we're taking the commutator of that with Z, but all of the operators X and PY and, and um, sorry, that should be X PY minus PX Y. Okay, all of those operators commute with Z. So the whole thing commutes with Z. They're just numbers as far as each one of them cares about the other. So that's zero. And now we can consider, and I'm just gonna ignore the N and N prime labels because they don't matter. We can consider this matrix element of the commutator Okay, but L sub Z in the commutator either is acting on this state where it's giving H bar M or it's acting on this state where it's giving H bar M prime. And so when you work this out, this is H bar M prime minus H bar M times L prime M prime Z L M. Okay, and on the other hand, this has to equal zero. This is what we wanna know. 
Okay, and so if this is non-zero, then the only way out is that this had to be zero. Okay, so this must be zero. Okay, and so we've proved what we wanted to prove, that if we want this to be non-zero, the only way is that m prime equals m. So that's a standard way of proving something about selection rules is you construct a commutator, which you can evaluate that involves the matrix element you want to investigate. In this particular case, there's an even easier alternate proof. The reason we didn't start with the alternate proof is just that it doesn't apply more generally in the same way, but you could just compute it. So L prime M prime Z, Lm. Again, we're just leaving off the n and n prime because they don't matter. This is proportional to an integral in position space, 0 to 2 pi d phi. And then if you look at the spherical harmonics for Lm, right, that's an e to the i m phi. For L prime m prime, that's an e to the minus i m prime phi prime. And the operator Z doesn't have any phi dependence, so I can just write one there. And so that's proportional to zero to two pi d phi e to the i m minus m prime phi, okay, which is only non-zero if m equals m prime. All right, so that's one selection rule for the operator Z. And next time we will start off by stating and proving a slightly more interesting selection rule for the operator Z. All of these are for the hydrogen atom. If you have some different system, you have to start over and worry about what the selection rules might be for that system. But since we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about the hydrogen atom, now is a good time to work out its selection rules for the operator Z. All right, so that's it for today. Are there any questions? All right, so if not, I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you, have a good one.